Happy Easter! Christ is risen! And this is the Paleocrat Diaries Paschal version. Welcome to Paschal Tide, everybody. I'm Jake Fowler, and I'll be your host for part 12 of the Ecumenical Councils. Look at that. I got a beer. Happy Easter, everybody. Mmm. Schlafly Oatmeal Stout. It's a St. Louis favorite. One of my favorites. One of my wife's favorites. We keep it around, you know, when we're not doing penance. All right. Nonetheless, here we are. We're looking at the time period we left off. I think I left you around 582. Emperor Maurice, we had just come through the Second Council of Constantinople. We've been looking at the Monophysite heresy, the three chapters controversy, Pope Vigilius, and the reception in the East and the West. And now here we are. We're sort of muddying the waters a little bit. Uh, I shouldn't say it like that. Maybe the lines are blurred. That's a better way to put it. The lines are blurred between where the Fifth Council ends and the Sixth one begins. We're in that, that transition, if you will. All right, without further ado. Okay. Once again, happy Easter. Glad to be back. It's been a couple weeks since I've produced anything on my own. We did the morning show today. It's Monday. It's Monday night. Kind of a little tired because I got up at, well, early, central time, the only real time. And now it's late. Kids are in bed. Everything's kind of just peaceful. And so this is the time for controversy. This is the time for crisis. This is the time for church history. I mentioned we're in about the year 582. Emperor Maurice has received the throne from his father-in-law, I believe, the Count Tiberius. Maurice rules for about 20 years. During this time, you've got a couple of popes. You've got uh, Pelagius II. You've got Gregory I. And then there was another one whose name I forgot. It's, like I mentioned, really kind of difficult or, or even impossible to draw a hard and fast line between where does one conciliar period begin and another end and vice versa. So instead of trying to say, well, that was the fifth council and this is the sixth one, we're just going to continue on just the way time naturally flows. The controversy naturally also continued on. It was monophysitism, right, which is Greek for one natureism, which held that there's just one nature in the person of Christ, not a divine and a human nature, but somehow a combination and post incarnation, there's just the one. The question, gathering my thoughts, the question of one nature in Christ wasn't really gaining any traction in the field of unity, right? A number of groups have been more or less schismatic, some formally, some materially, some sort of in between, since roughly the Council of Chalcedon, which declared definitively that Christ has two natures. In the 490s, the Armenians came out and said, look, we're Nestorian. Uh, we don't want to mess with any of this stuff you've got going on, so we're just going to be in schism doing our own thing over here. And then there were the Egyptians who didn't really declare it as such, but they retained their monophysitism uh, all through the 500s. Various measures were attempted. Justinian, Justin II, uh, Justin I, for that matter, all tried to reconcile the Monophysite heretics. Tiberius did the same thing. Maurice, the current emperor, he did the same thing. They tried various methods and strategies. They tried the Theopascite formula. Recall, this is the God-suffering formula, hence the name Theopascite. One of the Trinity suffered for us. That was what they were saying. And although true, orthodox, if understood properly, it was rejected by the popes, 
some of them anyhow, and it never really generated any of the unity that the monks, the Scythian monks who sort of were the big promoters of that phrase, it never generated the unity that they desired. They, they being the participants in this historical drama, Justinian at the head of this one, tried condemning the three chapters as well. This was another avenue of approach to reconcile with the Monophysites. The three chapters, I'm sure you recall by now, are the writings of these three Syrian theologians, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodoret of Cyrus and Ibas of Edessa. They were ultimately condemned at Constantinople too. And the condemnation was upheld and even ratified. Uh, maybe not ratified is, is a good term. Let's see. Supported, amplified by Pope Vigilius prior to his death. But nonetheless, so even rejecting these writings, right, and, and even the person of Theodore posthumously condemning him didn't have the desired effect of reconciling the Monophysites, right? And it, it risked jeopardizing Chalcedon as well. Finally, and most recently, under Justin II, the successor to Justinian, there was a revival of Zeno's Henoticon. This is the formula of union from the 480s. Right? So about 100 years later, little under, the emperor resurrects this attempt. Okay? But again, it just falls flat on its face. The Orthodox Catholic bishops, they don't want to give in, and the Monophysites will not be placated. There's nothing that the Catholics can do to conciliate them to where they're willing to drop their heresy or at least try to compromise. And as I mentioned at the end of part 11, they've got all these different sects now and they're sort of competing and they can't agree. In fact, there was a vacancy in the Church of Alexandria I forget around what year. I want to say it was in the late 570s. The patriarch, who was a Monophysite, died. And because of the infighting, it took them a year to agree on his replacement. Damien was his name. And I think he accessed the throne. He ascended the throne in 577. So that kind of gives you a little idea of just how divided the heretical side was. Not that everything was all sunshine and rainbows in the Catholic camp. Not at all. All right. So as we move forward, we're going to encounter the story of a pretty good emperor, heroic man, Heraclius. Heraclius was from Africa. Uh, he was born to a man named Heraclius, who himself was Armenian. So he's ethnically Armenian, but he's being raised in Roman Africa. And Heraclius Sr. was a general in the Roman army and quite a capable one at that. Now, the emperor around this time, so Maurice, mm, he lasted about 20 years, pretty good for an Eastern Roman emperor. But in about the year 602, he ran into some troubles. He was running out of money, for one, and he made a sort of boneheaded move with the military. He ordered one of the garrisons in particular to winter across the Danube. Now, the Danube cuts through Central Europe, and compared to the Mediterranean climate, uh, it would be somewhat less comfortable in the wintertime. And while you're wintering across the Danube in, in more or less Central Europe, um, why don't we go ahead and go on the offensive against some of these barbarian tribes that we've been having problems with? This is Maurice's thought process. And like I mentioned, he's out of money. So as if the weather wasn't a big enough problem, and oh, you want us to fight all winter when army, armies normally stay in their barracks and just sort of wait out until spring... You don't have any money to pay us either. Why do we want to fight for you? So Maurice got himself in a little hot water. And in fact, the troops rebelled. They 
caused him to flee back to the capital, and they proclaimed a certain Phocas, P-H-O-C-A-S, their new leader. Maurice was later overthrown as he was fleeing from Constantinople to Nicomedia by ship. The ship was detained and somehow brought back to port. Maurice and his five sons, this is in 602, they were executed. And the five sons had to go first so that Maurice could watch. When they had all perished, he himself was beheaded. Phocas was then proclaimed Roman emperor. Maurice's wife and, and daughters were spared for a few years, and then they met the same fate, I believe in the same harbor. Could be wrong about that one. This occasion, this, this coup, if you will, gave the king of the Persians, Khosroes II, I think I'm saying that right, I don't speak Persian, Khosroes II, this gave him a reason to sort of go on the offensive against the Romans, against the Byzantine Empire. And he did that, and he was actually pretty successful. There was a lot of turmoil in Constantinople. There was a lot of unrest, naturally. And so the Persians were pretty uh, opportunistic, I guess you could say, and they took up a lot of territory. This is the world into which Heraclius Jr., interjects himself, right? He kind of just says, you know what? I think I'm going to go ahead and take control. At the behest of his father and supplied with an army, he marches from Roman Africa, marches on Constantinople. By the time he gets there, he successfully deposes Phocas, and he himself is crowned emperor October 5th of the year 610. Immediately, Heraclius has to deal with the Persian threat. As I mentioned, under the leadership of their shah, the king, Khosroes II, the Persians had taken Antioch in 611, Damascus in 613, Jerusalem in 614, and Alexandria in 617. So they're kicking tail. The Persian Empire is expanding. The Roman Empire is now shrinking. And during this impressive advance, a lot of the holy items, venerable, sacred items in Christianity were taken, notably the true cross, taken from its home in Jerusalem back into the heart of the Persian Empire. This is the same cross discovered in the 300s by the mother of Constantine the Great, St. Helena. It was carried to Jerusalem then, right? It was found just outside of the city. And now it's carried away into pagan territory. There were some Christians in Persia, but not primarily. It was Heraclius and the patriarch of Constantinople, a man named Sergius, who drummed up support for a holy war to go and retake the captured territory. You could think of this, it's not exactly a crusade, but sort of a crusade, right? It wasn't liberating the holy land from the Mohammedan infidels, but it was taken back our Byzantine territory from these Persian conquerors, right? And they used religion, I don't, I don't want to say used as if that was a bad thing, religion was absolutely a motivating factor here. They stole the true cross. We have to get that back. And they conquered our holy cities, the ancient patriarchal seas, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and they got Damascus too. Doggone it. So Heraclius and Sergius, they gain a lot of support for this war and about a decade later, which is pretty quick if you think about ancient warfare, right? We're in late antiquity in the 600s. The, the technology is not great. By 629, Heraclius has reclaimed all of the territory that he lost and 
the Holy Cross. He triumphantly has it brought back to Christian lands. He had pushed, in fact, the war so deep into Persian territory that eventually, before the very capital, Nineveh, they had to surrender. A peace treaty was struck between Heraclius and the Shah. Now, throughout the campaign, which lasted a long time, Heraclius himself reigned about 30 years, a little more. And this military campaign against the Persians took up roughly a third of it, maybe about 40%. It's about 12 years or so. No, I'm sorry, longer than that maybe even closer to two-thirds. Nonetheless, throughout his campaign, Heraclius had been in conference with various Monophysites as he's moving around the known world. He's coming into contact with people, right? He's trying to pick up where Maurice had left off. I don't know about the religious policies of Phocas, but I have to imagine that he didn't really do a whole lot of things differently probably tried to reconcile the Monophysites, and clearly was unsuccessful. Nonetheless, Heraclius is doing the same thing. He's in talks. In 622, he's speaking to people in Armenia. In 626, he's speaking to people in the Caucasus. In 631, he's speaking to people in Syria. In each of these locales, he made an attempt to persuade them, of course, with the aid of his theological advisors, that there was, in fact, a way to reconcile Catholic teaching, and Monophysite teaching. He wanted to make them aware that we don't have to do this anymore. We don't have to toy around with the material or formal schism, or we're really not quite sure what, no, you're a heretic, no, you're a heretic. We don't have to do any of that. He has devised a plan. In 626, while he was near the Black Sea, Heraclius met a certain bishop, Cyrus. Cyrus was having trouble reconciling the proposals of the emperor with the faith that he had received and, indeed, had been charged with handing on. So Heraclius directs him to consult the patriarch of Constantinople, Sergius. Sergius sent to Cyrus the bishop, a dossier full of documents that seemed to support what the emperor was saying. Now, what exactly was the emperor saying? Well, I mentioned towards the beginning of our time together here in part 12 that the conversation had shifted from whether or not there was one or two natures in Christ to a question of whether or not there was one or two operations, or one or two energies. So we have the terms monoenergism entering, as well as monothelitism. Monoenergism would be one energy, and monothelitism would be one operation or one will. That's how I'll probably express it to you from here on out. One will, right? We all have a free will, Christ has free will, too, actually. And so the heresy of monothelitism wants to say that he only has the one, and it's used interchangeably with monoenergism. Okay, we've got that out of the way. So Heraclius proposes, well, we don't have to worry about the question about natures anymore. If we just focus in on the operations of Christ, that, that will be the key to reconciling the Monophysites. Now, Sergius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, had sent this batch of documents to Cyrus, a bishop near the Black Sea, among which was reportedly a letter written by Pope Vigilius. Now, I believe the letter turned out to be inauthentic. Nonetheless, Cyrus is convinced So, he is now on board with the emperor's new plan to reconcile the Monophysites through this new formula, this monothelitism, or that the fact there is one will 
in Christ. In 631, while Heraclius is still kind of touring around, trying to reconcile with people, trying to be, you know, engage in talks and dialogue, encounter, he's meeting them where they are and they're journeying together and accompanying. Okay, I got to stop. Heraclius is engaging with a lot of people. And the patriarch of Alexandria dies. And Heraclius knows, I know the guy for the job. I got the right man, Cyrus. Cyrus, my guy, you have been convinced of my new program. Sergius and you have been in contact. You've seen the light. And now I'm blessing you with the Patriarchate of Alexandria. Cyrus immediately went to work reconciling the Monophysites in Egypt and the Catholics that were remaining there. Presumably, he would have done this through preaching, conferences with the leading men of the day, and surely he would have wanted to groom and ordain priests who were welcoming to these new ideas. The main point in the outreach to the Monophysites, well, it was basically three main points. Number one, if Christ has but one single source of all his actions, right, one will, then there's no way Catholics can be accused of being Nestorian. And point two, if Catholics are not Nestorian, then Monophysites have no need to reject them. Okay. And point three, if there's no need for rejection, then come back to the unity of the faith. Simple as that. One will in Christ means we're not Nestorian means you don't need to reject us, so come on back. It's a three-step plan. Cyrus and Heraclius and Sergius, they've got it all worked out. Apparently, though, uh, I may be downplaying it too much because these three ifs were quite effective. In 633, an act of union was signed by the Catholics and the Monophysites, declaring their agreement with the points that I mentioned above. It's worth noting this is no small achievement. Remember, Egypt is the Monophysite stronghold. This is the impenetrable territory. Hardened Egypt has now been brought back. This is the scene, the locale, where there have been numerous bloody riots, deaths in the streets, deaths of priests and bishops, deaths of monks being beaten and torn to pieces and eaten, possibly. But now they're like, yeah, it's cool. We're back. Hmm. Monothelitism is now in full swing. It's endorsed in Constantinople. It's endorsed in Alexandria. It won't be long before it's endorsed all over the East. Now, Leave it to the Lord to raise up a champion in a time like this. He does. He always does. And this time around, it's a monk, right? Athanasius, he started as a monk too, I believe. So we, here we have another Athanasius. Now, this man's name was Sophronius. Sophronius was present in Alexandria when Cyrus was effecting the union of the Catholics and the Monophysites. He was from the Holy Land, from Jerusalem or thereabouts, and he was quite orthodox and very intelligent as well. He was an able theologian, and he took his concerns to Cyrus. He says, um, Your Excellency, I'm not really sure that this is a good idea. If we say there's only a single source of will or a single operation in Christ, then what about his divine nature and his human nature? And Cyrus says, you don't have to worry about that. Let me put you in touch with my guy. We've got a man on the inside in Constantinople. It's the patriarch, you know, Sergius. He's really buddy-buddy with the emperor Heraclius, and I think you should talk to him. Remember, it was Cyrus himself who expressed 
similar concerns to the emperor and was directed to go talk to Sergius. So now when Sophronius brings the concerns to Cyrus, he says, well, go talk to Sergius. I mean, naturally, that's what you would do. Cyrus had expressed difficulty reconciling it, and he was convinced. Sophronius now expresses some hesitation, some difficulty reconciling these two points. And so hopefully, right, this must have been what Cyrus was thinking. Hopefully we can convince him too, because what a powerful ally, really holy guy, really smart too. And he could take this back to Jerusalem and begin the work of reconciliation there. Sophronius went as directed, right? He was obedient. He went to Constantinople. He saw Sergius, and he brings his concerns to Sergius. Now, instead of being convinced, he instead is confirmed in his previous belief that this is heterodoxy, that this is contrary to the faith. However, Sophronius respects the hierarchy. Sergius told him, look, you really shouldn't be talking about this. He says, "Mm, I forbid you to speak publicly on these matters. You see, we don't want to start a new controversy. Why don't you be a good boy now and run along back to Jerusalem and just go pray and do monk stuff. Don't worry about it. It's fine. So, Sophronius, being the obedient monk that he was, returns to the Holy Land, and he submits himself to the judgment of the patriarch. He undertakes a public silence with respect to the question of one or two wills in Christ. But wouldn't you know it, right when he gets back to Jerusalem, the patriarch is dead and they need a new guy. And they chose him. Sophronius is installed now as Patriarch of Jerusalem. And as Patriarch, equal in stature to the Patriarch of Constantinople, Sergius, well, Sophronius doesn't really feel the need to maintain public silence anymore. And I think he's got a point. On the one hand, when he was just a monk, I don't mean just a monk, like monks aren't a big deal. Monks are extremely crucial. But he wasn't a patriarch. He wasn't a bishop. When he was a monk, he could just go back to his monastery and pray and live out his existence peacefully serving the Lord and nobody would be the wiser. But now that he has a public ministry teaching the faith, guarding the deposit of faith, handing it on to the next generation. These aren't matters you can keep quiet about. Sophronius knew this. So he uses his position for what it's meant to be used for, to teach and defend the faith. He has a duty to do the exact opposite of what he was commanded to do by Sergius of Constantinople. Now, as it was customary, Sophronius sent letters around, letting everyone know that he was elected as the new patriarch of Jerusalem, and he sent a confession of faith, as is pretty standard. And he also says, by the way, there's this new heresy going around. Yeah, it's called monothelitism. They say that Christ only has one will. I think this is really a problem, guys. We should look into it. He, in fact, denounces the bishops and the priests who defend this doctrine as wolves. You might even say wolves in sheep's clothing. Truly they were. Sergius must have seen this coming. He wrote a letter to the Pope. The Pope at this time, very famous, Honorius the first. Sergius writes to Honorius detailing the conversations he previously had with Sophronius before he was installed as Patriarch of Jerusalem. He says, you know, I did tell this guy to shut his mouth about it. I don't know what his problem is. 
He won't just let it go. He's going to start a problem, you know. This is going to be another controversy. So Sergius is explaining to Honorius. Sergius explains further that to speak of one operation or one will, this would startle some people because it would seem to be just another form of monophysitism. And indeed, it, it sort of was, is. To speak of two operations or two wills, this would be detrimental also, since it would be a novelty. It might be offensive to pious ears. Some people might not understand how doctrine develops and how over time we have new expressions for things that we've always believed but didn't necessarily explicitly articulate, right? This is something we struggle with to this day, right? If you're watching this, chances are you would consider yourself a trad Catholic. And this is a bit of a blind spot for people in our shoes, right? I'm a trad Catholic, you're a trad Catholic. And we sometimes struggle to identify what's a legitimate doctrinal development and what isn't. What's a rupture and what's new growth, legitimate growth, on the tree, as it were. What is organic and what isn't? And how do you know? We struggle with this. Well, they did too, right? Sergius identifies this. He says, look, if we go around saying one will, two wills, this is new new talk, right? Nobody says this. This is going to scandalize people. So it's better if we all just stay quiet about it. Sergius explains further that Sophronius had agreed to this. So not only did he say, look, I told him, and this is going to be a problem. But he says, Holy Father, the guy said yes. The guy agreed. Sophronius said he would be quiet. And here he is running his mouth. Now as bishop, he got a big head. He's starting a new controversy. The reply of Pope Honorius I to Sergius is very interesting. Honorius begins by acknowledging that, indeed, silence is best. And he says that, Sergius, you have acted prudently in this decision. Following this, Honorius lays out what the Catholic Church believes about one or two wills. Listen carefully. And this is, by the way, the letter that gets him in a little bit of trouble later on. Honorius says, what does the church believe? We believe that there's one will in Christ. He says, there can only be one will, since he took upon himself a nature that was free from original sin. This nature, being sinless, would not operate in diverse ways, since the law of the flesh and the law of God would not be in opposition in him. Hmm. He said one will, but when we digest his explanation, well, he's not really talking about the divine will and the human will. It seems to me that Honorius is specifically referring to the human will in Christ. He's saying there couldn't be duplicity. There couldn't be separation. There couldn't be hmm, his nature, his human nature, raging against itself, trying to fulfill the law of God, because indeed, he was the perfect sinless man, God and man. So it seems like Honorius isn't referring to one will or two wills with respect to the divine and the human nature of Christ, the divine will and the human will, but that he's referring to within the human nature, within the human will of Christ, that there is really just oneness. Okay, that's different. That's orthodox, right? He says one will or one operation because he means it in a certain way. Now, it will be taken the wrong way. 
Sergius wants to say one will or one operation in order to reconcile the monophysites. He is using it to say, well, the source of activity isn't divine or human, but sort of one thing. That's not correct. If that were correct, that would mean that Christ doesn't have a true human will. And if he didn't have a true human will, he wouldn't have a true human nature. Therefore, he wouldn't be truly man. Therefore, his sacrifice on the cross didn't really atone for man as man, right? Man qua man. That didn't happen if, in fact, Christ isn't truly a man. Right? The fathers before this time period, we would look back and say the greats from this time period were also church fathers. They wouldn't have said that, obviously. The, the Antonicene and the Nicene fathers, they say things like, that which is not assumed is not redeemed. In other words, meaning whatever Christ didn't take on couldn't have been redeemed by his atoning sacrifice. So if Christ didn't assume a true human will as a part of his true human nature, then our wills are not purified, our wills are not cleansed or redeemed in any way. And where's the center or the source of all of our sins, if not our will? Right? This was the problem that the heretic Apollinaris ran into. He said that Christ didn't have a human soul. Well, if he had not a human soul, and all of our sins originate in our soul, in virtue of our intellect and our will, then Apollinaris denied redemption. Sergius of Constantinople is doing a very similar thing here. He's saying, well, there's just the one will in Christ, the divine will. So our human wills aren't redeemed. So my will is stuck in its sins. So Christ's sacrifice really did nothing for me. Some redemption. Thanks be to God, that's not correct, by the way. Honorius, on the other hand, he means one will or two wills as far as within the motivations of his human will, at least as far as I can tell. This is perfectly orthodox. And how it works, I'll explain it later on, probably in the next part when we discuss St. Maximus the Confessor. In a second letter to Sergius, Pope Honorius reiterates his command to hold silence on these matters. He regards them as little more than exercises for schoolboys. He really doesn't understand why do we have to spend our time talking about this? This is foolish. Just be quiet. It's not clear to me at this point that Honorius really understands what's at stake. Maybe he does. Maybe he does, and he's just trying to minimize the controversy. Okay, that's possible. Maybe he really doesn't. And he just sort of thinks this is all irrelevant, and why are we talking about it anyway? Also possible. Perhaps unlikely but possible. Either case, he recognizes at a minimum that this is going to create a disturbance, and so he counsels silence, as pre, uh, previously Sergius had also said. We've arrived at about the year 638. Now, this is the year Honorius died. I believe he died in October. Now, don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. But he died in 638. He was pope from 625, 13 years, died in 638. In order to enforce, right, so now we have Sergius of Constantinople and Honorius, Pope of Rome. They are agreeing silence is the best policy. So in order to enforce this, Sergius pens what's become known as the ecthesis, or a declaration of faith to ensure that everyone is on board with the new program of public silence, the patriarch writes up an edict, an imperial law, 
that's meant to be circulated around to all the bishops and all the civil officials. They'll all sign it, and everybody will get along. Except that it's never worked that way before, right? Going back to Zeno in the 480s, up through Justinian and his successors, and now here we are again under Heraclius trying the same thing. We need imperial unity on matters of religion. Let's make a law. Doesn't work that way. Nonetheless, even though they have clearly not learned their lesson that edicts don't work, particularly when they're opposed to the truth, the ecthesis was circulated around and everybody was expected to be on board. It was basically a restatement of Sergius's and Honorius's policy to keep quiet about one or two wills, one or two operations in the person of Christ. Except, kind of strange, I'm sure it was an oversight. Sergius states, quote, We profess that there is but a single will. I thought we were supposed to keep quiet. This is anything but. He's making his doctrinal stand on monothelitism. He's decided. And he's decided in such a way that will induce all of the bishops of the world to sign on to this. Sergius published it, having obtained Heraclius' signature in late 638. Honorius had already died, Sophronius was dead, and Sergius died just a few months later, after confirming the declaration in a local synod. Right? It's good to have synodality or something like that. Uh, oh, here we go. Honorius died in October. I was correct the first time. I believe it was the 12th. But now I don't see, I'm getting myself all hung up on the details. Whenever it was, Honorius is dead. Sophronius is dead. Sergius is about to be dead. And there's a really, really long conclave. Honorius's vacancy, the sede vacante, is not filled for 18 months. During this time, the ecthesis is circulating the Roman Empire. We declare there's but a single will in Christ, echoing in the back of everyone's minds. And it's just disseminating and sort of simmering, and there's no one there to oppose it, at least not many. The two, well, the one guy who really could, Sophronius, he died. And Honorius, maybe he would have done something else if he had realized what Sergius meant, but he died. Finally, in 640, a new pope, John IV, he's elected, he ascends the throne in Rome, and he demands that the ecthesis be withdrawn. Heraclius, merely a signatory, or so he said, he didn't object. His submission to the Roman pontiff was made in late 640 or early 641, just before he died in February of that year. Hmm. I think we'll stop here. We've covered a little bit more. That's what we're doing here. We're taking it a little at a time. We've got ourselves from about 582 up to 641. 59 years. Pretty good. In the next episode, episode 13 of the Ecumenical Councils with everyone's favorite docent, this guy. We will look at the years leading up to the Sixth Ecumenical Council, that of Constantinople III, which is held in 680. I don't foresee that we will actually cover the council, taking it, as we do, somewhat slowly. And I don't want to neglect the details. The details are fun. I enjoy telling the story. So there's no harm, or at least I don't think there is, to draw it out a little bit. All right, nonetheless, here we are, 
We're in 641. The Monothelite controversy is heating up. And next time, we'll get a little farther down the road. Hopefully, understanding a little bit more about our past and how it applies to our present, right? That's kind of the point of this whole series. Anyways, thanks for your time. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for your attention. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe, to comment. All of those things help us. Be sure to patronize the meaning of Catholic and the Paleocrat Diaries. And until next time, never give up. Keep on smiling and memento mori.